Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Morris County Economic Development Corporation member meeting for the first quarter 2017. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Megan Huncher. I'm executive director of the Morris County EDC. Uh, today we are broadcasting this in-person member meeting also through a live webinar. I'm hopeful that all will go without hitch, a hitch, but thank you in advance for your patience. Um, if we have to work out any te technical difficulties. Uh, for those of you who are on the line, you are muted, but you can ask questions or alert us to any difficulties hearing or seeing the presentation by typing on the side. Uh, Robert Wanhouse is monitoring the screen, and um, he will take note of your comments. All right, so firstly, I want to thank Howard Weinberg. Um, of JLL for speaking today and for being our lead sponsor. So thank you, Howard. Howard serves on the MCEDC board. Uh, he's been a longtime supporter of our, of our organization. I'd also like to recognize Maria Sheridan, who's our new chair of the EDC board uh, this year. She's also the senior director of government affairs and business development for DM Airports at the Morristown Municipal Airport. So please speak with her about all of your uh, aviation needs. Um, Maria was also recognized just this week as one of the top 50 women in business in New Jersey. So we're fortunate to have her on our board. So thank you, Maria. Um, also, in addition to the Chamber's annual meeting, the EDC will have it there at our annual meeting on March 10th. So please plan to join us with over 200 uh, professionals and leaders. Um, at the Birchwood Manor to celebrate the largest real estate transactions in Morris County, as well as business retention, attraction, and expansion. Jay Bathna, who's an executive with Allergan, will be our keynote speaker. You all find um, the flyer on uh, your, um, your chair. We also have an additional sponsor, uh, Langen Engineering, will be sponsoring as well. Um, please speak with me or Robert if you have any questions. You can register through the Chamber website for this event. I hope you can all join us uh, next month. Uh, so now to our presentation. Uh, today we have uh, speakers in the next hour will address office, industrial, retail, residential markets, and demographics in the county and generally. Um, it's our opportunity for us in this first quarter of the year to look back on 2016 and identify trends that will affect the county moving forward. Um, our first speaker today is Mr. Howard Weinberg, who is a commercial real estate broker with JLL. Howard is accompanied by two of his colleagues, um, who he will also introduce. Um, following Howard, we will hear from uh, Mr. Mark Hayes, who is again uh, with us from Ohio. Mark is with Stanbury Development. Stanbury developed the shops at Union Hill in Denville, if you're all familiar, and he's currently developing a mixed-use property on Route 10, primarily in Parsippany, but also in Hanover. Uh, and then following Mark, we will be hearing from Mr. Mike Elms, who's with a, a real estate agent with Remax Properties Unlimited in Marstown with a specialty in residential. And then finally, we will hear from Ms. Christine Marion, who is the Director of Planning uh, for Mars County, Christine has a wealth of information to share related to demographics in Mars County. Howard. So this uh, this works. Or how it works. Robert can help Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Howard Weinberg from uh, JLL, and I also want to introduce my two associates, Steve Jenko. He's the vice president for the Tri-County Area for Research, and Iggy Armenia from uh, our senior so uh, analyst for industrial real estate. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank Megan for inviting me, uh, Robert, who's done a great job organizing this, and Paul also for as part of the team. What we're going to do is review uh, commercial real estate in, uh, for New Jersey and Morris County, uh, specifically office properties and industrial properties. That's really what our specialty is. And it's really a uh, same thing over again. Uh, we did this, I think, about two years ago. We did a presentation, industrial and office, and 
Office really hasn't changed much. Uh, there's been some uh, large transactions, but it's really people, and you will see from the statistics, moving from one building, consolidating, and going to a different building. Industrial is a totally different market. Is uh, New Jersey is what I would call white hot on industrial real estate, and Morris County is not white hot, but red hot. And and uh, we've had it's a little bit different market than the ports, exit 8A, the Meadowlands, uh, but we get a lot of that fallout, and it's only benefited everybody in Morris County. So what we're going to do is Steve is going to start walk you through the office market, and then Iggy is going to walk you through the industrial market. And I think Megan, you want to hold any questions until everyone has gone through their presentation? Yes. Okay. So Steve, why don't you start with um, the initial? Great. Uh, thanks, Howard. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Howard mentioned, I'm going to be touching on the office market oh, very brief, brief, very briefly. Oh, I don't want to block the screen. I'll stand here. Um, just as you see from this slide here, uh, we're tracking the office market in, in Morris County about 26 million feet. To put that into perspective, it's the largest office market in northern New and central New Jersey, and our total office market size that we're tracking is about 160 million feet, and that's Class A and Class B office space. Um, about 70% of the space that we do track in New Jersey is classified as Class A. Um, it's also among the most recognized office markets in the state. Um, most of the buildings haven't been developed in the 1980s. Um, much of the development um, is in the Parsippany Route 24 area corridor markets, um, and it's really developed because of the highway networks, whether it be 287, 80, uh, Route 10, 46. So a little bit different um, than some of the other markets, like a, a Newark market or a Hudson Waterfront, which is more transit, uh, mass transit driven. This is more of a suburban market that, that's obviously a more commuter and a, and a car friendly um, type of environment. Um, great infrastructure in place here. Uh, and also strong local demographics, um, high per capita income, Morris County, uh, nearly $50,000 um, compared to about $36,500 for the state. Also a well-educated <laughs> workforce. Um, about half of the uh, Morris County population is college educated compared to about a third of the population for the rest of New Jersey. What we did here is kind of look at a five-year view of uh, the northern and central New Jersey market and as well as Morris County. Uh, on a quarterly basis, we have fluctuations. We have positive, negative uh, absorption, um, vacancies that are going up and down. But long-term trends, we can see it's a pretty flat market. Um, overall vacancy rate, um, we can see for northern and central New Jersey here, mm -hmm. is only um, about 1 percentage point lower uh, than we were back in 2012. So not a tremendous um, change at all. The themes of the past year, 2016, uh, inconsistent quarterly leasing activity. By that I mean that on a quarterly basis, we started off slow, uh, about 2 million feet of transactions in northern and central New Jersey, and that includes uh, new deals, subleases, as well as renewals, um, expansions, and so forth. Uh, that number increased a little bit to about 3 million feet in the second and third quarters, but again, we lost steam and we dropped back down to 2 million feet in the fourth quarter. Uh, the other thing that we saw in addition to that inconsistent leasing activity was sublease space. Uh, we saw about 730,000 square feet of sublease space come onto the New Jersey market during the past year. Um, some of the names are probably pretty familiar. Um, a lot of it on the pharmaceutical side, Sanofi, Valiant, uh, Novo Nordisk, uh, Tyco, um, as well as Daiichi, uh, putting blocks of space onto the market. And that's really helped to keep us on, on a level playing field there that versus you know, the demand that we see in the market. Um, County Morris County, um, it's a, a little bit of a worse picture than northern and central New Jersey. We're close to 33% from a vacancy standpoint. And again, we've been near that level now for the past five years. Uh, and this is really the highest vacancy rate that we're tracking uh, in northern and central New Jersey. And the number behind that is about 9 million feet of um, direct and sublease space that's being available, uh, that's being marketed for lease in Morris County. Now that number does include um, the former um, BASF campus out in Mount Olive, which is a little over a million feet or so. So um, even if we did take out that Mount Olive campus from our stats, the uh, vacancy rate drops to about 29%. So again, still well above our, our average for northern and central New Jersey. 
focusing just on Mars County, uh, northern central New Jersey, just on the Class A side. Um, again, um, Class A vacancy rate um, close to that 25% level since uh, back to 2012. Um, tenant requirements uh, have really been met by corporate restructurings, corporate consolidations. Um, it's really uh, a variety of factors that companies are looking to get more bang for the buck, uh, cutting down on, on their workspaces, um, shared workspaces and so forth, um, and that's really reducing a lot of these corporate uh, footprints that we see in the, uh, in the market. Um, and really mirroring uh, the New Jersey Class A market has been Morris County, again, in that 30% that uh, range. Uh, some of the, the, uh, the blocks of space that came onto the market here, again, I mentioned Daiichi, but in Morris County, AIG, uh, Lewis Berger in the fourth quarter put uh, subway space on the market. Um, one of the other large blocks that came on the market was Quest Diagnostics, um, relocated to Sea Caucus uh, last year. Uh, and they resulted in about 141,000 square feet being available um, at three draw the farms in Madison. Um, on the leasing side, um, the largest deal that took place in Morris County and, and as well as the state uh, was Allergan um, deciding to move their headquarters to five draw the farms. Um, for its, uh, it's about 431,500 square foot office building. Uh, some of the other larger deals that took place in the market, um, Ogilvy Common Health, uh, they renewed for their about 84,000 square feet at Mars Corporate Center 3 in Parsippany, uh, while Tango uh, leased about 60,000 uh, feet at 169 Lackawanna Avenue. But again, it was a movement within the market. Um, they were already located at 20 Waterview Boulevard in uh, Parsippany. Um, Again, looking at uh, what's driving um, our vacancy rate is, is we took another angle here in terms of just looking at the blocks of space that are, that, that are behind the numbers that, that, that we're seeing here. Um, in Morris County Class A market, um, we're tracking about 6 million feet just of Class A space that's available. Um, and we can really see the, the two ends of the spectrum here that are driving that, that number. Um, about 32%, a little over 32% are on the lower end, the 10 to 25,000 square foot uh, block of space. But what's a little bit concerning is the number at the high end there, the, the blocks of space, uh, buildings that have at least 100,000 square feet available. And that's close to 30% of the available space in the market. So again, um, you know, these buildings, and we're tracking in the neighborhood about 20 individual buildings in Morris County. Um, that, that, that those large blocks are really weighing heavily on our, our current vacancy rate. And just to dive in a little bit more detail about Mars County, I mentioned some of the markets, Route 24, Parsippany. Uh, they're the two primary markets. Also, to a certain extent, Western Route 80, which is a, is a market west of the 280, uh, 287-80 um, um, inter intersection there. But when you're looking at Mars County, um, Parsippany is really the, the barometer for Morris County. Um, it's about 15 million square feet of rentable space in, in Parsippany, and this makes about half of our office market here in Morris County is located in the Parsippany market. I've you know, included some of the towns um, that, that make up the Parsippany market. Um, but again, um, we can see the Mars County being close at 33%, and again, uh, Parsippany falling within that neighborhood as well. Western Route 80, as I mentioned, uh, former BASF headquarters, um, that's that 65%, a really inflated number. Um, but if we took that number out, or that, that campus out, the amount of direct space in, in Western Route 80, which is a very small market, uh, drops out to about um, a 27% uh, vacancy rate. And last slide, uh, we're going to talk, just mention briefly about um, rental rate um, progression, again, going back five years. Um, and really the opportunities continue for, for tenants that are looking for space in, in Morris County. Um, as a whole, Morris County Class A rents have increased less than 6% uh, during the past uh, five years. Class B rents have, have declined, really no story there because it's really been a flight of quality that we see in the market. Companies um, consolidating, looking at the Class B space and, and so forth and deciding, you know what, now's our chance to, to lock in those, those Class A um, buildings. Uh, we did see the, the Class A rental rate for Northern Central New Jersey increase a little bit. Um, you can see it's actually about $2 uh, back to 2012. Um, it kind of goes against the, the market uh, metrics there with the supply and demand, but um, 
what we saw behind that rental rate there is really that new space or additional available space that's coming on the market is being marketed at higher rental rates. So again, it's a different price on a car. It's being put out to the market at a certain rental rate, but then the negotiations start from there in terms of um, what that space will actually lease uh, for them. Uh, within Morris County, um, Route uh, 24 submarket uh, has a rental rate of about 31.40 per square foot for Class A space. And uh, in the participating market, it's closer to about 27.75 per square foot. Um, I think I'm going to end it right there. All right. And we're going to just review the industrial side of the market, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Great. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Iggy Armenia. I'm the senior analyst covering exclusively industrial for northern and central New Jersey. Uh, when we talk about, just as over, we talk about northern New Jersey, because I'm going to be comparing that to Morris County a lot. Nor northern New Jersey on this map is anything you're seeing in uh, that tan color, while central New Jersey is anything in, in blue. Uh, when we're talking about New Jersey, we really don't talk about South Jersey. That, that's more of a Philly-driven, Philadelphia-driven market, where these two markets are really the main drivers are the port of, of Newark, and New York City. So Morris County uh, is its own submarket within the industrial market. It's comprised about 38 million square feet. All of northern New Jersey is roughly 350 million square feet, so it's slightly greater than 10% of our market. And as Howard mentioned, from an industrial side, we really consider this to be what we call a secondary market, given that it doesn't have direct access to the New Jersey Turnpike, which is what major big box or Fortune 500 clientele tend to prefer. They want the logistically superior locations that are only a few minutes from a, uh, from a, a major interchange. So when we, look at, uh, when we look at net absorption, which is essentially uh, the a number of move-ins expressed in, in square footage, uh, over the past 15 years versus the number of new construction deliveries for the whole market, uh, we get a pretty strong picture of why vacancy continues to fall. So the absorption, as you can see, has really, <coughs> excuse me, has really increased as of late as the industrial market has continued to heat up. And the reason for that, the main reason for that being, besides a growing economy, besides uh, more and more TEU volume through the port has been e-commerce. E-commerce has been a massive driver, you know, not only of taking away from retail, but causing um, uh, industrial to to explode. Uh, and can you just define TEU? Just yeah, TEU is a is a 20 uh, foot equivalent unit. That's the boxes you see uh, the containers off the container ships. So essentially, if you think of the big ones, like a 53-foot one that you'd see on the back of a truck, half of that is a single TEU. So when you see the full, those, those double stacked ones, those are actually two TEUs. Um, so as you can see here, vacancy in northern New Jersey, due to that e-commerce effect, has fallen to just about 4%, um, whereas historically, going back past the recession and the global financial crisis, we were you know, we were at lows in the in the sixes. So that there's been a 200 point delta, uh, which has become important for for many reasons. Um, one of them is it all, it all comes down to pricing. Uh, asking rental rate pricing has gone up. Sales pricing has gone up. Essentially, as supply has dwindled and demand has shot through the roof, we're seeing pricing start to move. Not only on your real estate but on your operating costs as well, mainly labor. So uh, e-commerce and, and other large operations that are trying to get a lot of volume through may have significant robotics, which you might have heard of, you know, think Amazon, right? Uh, tons of automation. That automation isn't replacing jobs. Uh, it's just increasing the flow through those facilities. Their demand is actually, for labor, they're putting three times the number of employees in a single facility that a traditional warehouse operation would. So we've also seen a tremendous squeeze on the supply of labor qualified to work in, a, in these type of facilities. And that's caused, at, 
locally here in New Jersey, but also on a global level, wages for blue collar labor freight worker, I believe is how the, the BLS defines it, to go up at a rate one and a half, two times, three times or greater than uh, the wage rate growth for all other occupations. So here's a, now, now to bring it back to Morgan County a little bit, you can see that this effect has continued in, not just in those main markets along the turnpike, but you're getting spillover demand as some of those other tenants are priced out of a market because an Amazon comes in and are moving out towards Morris County. Uh, so as you can see here, Morris County vacancy since 2011, which is really one of the high points of the recession, it's delayed, you know, when you usually talk about recession, we think 2007, um, but there's some lag in real estate. So think that is sort of your high point in terms of vacancy and low points in terms of average rent. Uh, was at 12.1 percent. You know, we're all we're now down to 6.8 percent. We've almost cut that in half. Um, and similarly, you can see the Meadowlands, which is typically that primary market right outside of New Jersey. I'm sorry, right outside of New York City. That's where a lot of your tenant base starts to move when they get priced out of the Meadowlands, which can reach up to $10 or $12 per square foot on an annual basis um, um, for for a new lease. Whereas Morris County, maybe closer to six. So here's an example of, of exactly that. Uh, uh, when we're looking at pricing, we've seen pricing skyrocket to $7.30 in northern New Jersey, really driven by that primary corridor. Um, but the same effect is vacancy has slipped below 5% in the other markets or in, in Morris County below 7 percent We're starting to see that accelerate. So if Morris County continues to drop, so we go back one second, you know, continues to drop to these levels, these sub five levels, we would expect that pricing would continue to accelerate or accelerate at an even faster rate than it already is. And finally, um, looking beyond leasing at the sales side of, of this, and it's a very similar story. There's a bit of ups and downs in here, but the trend is, is a continued increase in pricing and a fairly significant one, you know, from 2011, get it $40 per square foot. Now at 80, you've seen prices essentially double. Uh, and and the truth is, that's really an index number. Um, you know, it's not untypical or atypical to see pricing for industrial buildings of $120 a square foot. Um, you see some some real. This looks 2016 may look like a down year for us in, in compared to 2015. 2015 was an astronomically high year driven by mega portfolio sales or, or sales of hundreds of buildings nationally that were lumped together. So uh, GLP, which is now the second largest industrial real estate owner in the country, didn't exist two years ago. They purchased, they purchased two or three other portfolios in 2015, and that's really where all of this growth came from. Similarly, a portfolio sale of a fully stabilized or fully leased set of buildings purchased by an investor, Torino, uh, really bumped the average sale prices uh, in, in 2014. That's why I say ignore the ups and downs a little bit. The trend has been significantly upwards. And, and while I don't expect any years to get up to this level uh, without any barring any very significant portfolio trades, uh, we would continue to see growth um, throughout the next two years. Great. Thank you very much, Iggy and Steve. Um, so, Mark, are you there? I am. Excellent. Greetings from New Jersey. So you, heard, <laughs> so you heard Iggy mention e-commerce, which affects your world. It is. Um, Take it away. OK. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, as, as Megan mentioned, my name is Mark Hayes. I'm with a group called uh, Stanbury Development. Um, before I get started, real quick, just let me thank Megan and Robert and the rest of the Morris County Economic Development staff for um, you know, the invitation to be with you guys this morning. I am sorry that I was not able to be there in person, but um, my travel schedule coupled with some 
other obligations wouldn't allow for it. So, um, so my apologies for that, but, uh, but uh, we can get started here. Um, as a bit of a backdrop, um, Stanbury has traditionally been a developer of kind of higher end retail fashion driven shopping centers. Um, as Megan mentioned, uh, in this area we're probably best known for the shops of Union Hill in Denville. Um, we did sell that center earlier last year, but are very proud of uh, what a success as it has been and uh, will continue to be under the new ownership. Um, also, as Megan mentioned, we are in the midst of a new project in, in Morris County, uh, the district at 1515. About two years ago, we bought the old Dialogic or Intel office site on Route 10, Parsippany and Hanover. Uh, we're working to develop it into a mixed use project that will be made up of service uses and multifamily. It may evolve into to include other uses as well. Uh, we'll see what the market dictates there. Um, I kind of share this with you not as a promo on Stanbury, but to simply give you a little bit of background and, and explain to you why some guy from Ohio is <laughs> on the phone talking to all of you about uh, Morris County. Um, Having said that to uh, some of Steve's comments on office, the good news is Stanbury is looking to eliminate some of the office in Morris County while providing some nice complimentary amenities. So um, having said that, let's get started. Um, I am having a little difficulty moving the slides though. Give it a shot now. Try it now, Mark. Yeah, I'm still having difficulty. Okay, we'll do it. We can do it from here. Perfect. Let me know. All right. <clears throat> All right. There we go. All right. So um, here's a map of Morris County. Um, uh, we'll need to spend a lot of time on this. Um, the reason I include the map other than to kind of simply orient us was to point out how little upscale retail Morris County actually has. Um, if you can, uh, you know, as you, as you look at that map, the, the little red dots are really representative of where the major uh, fashion retail hubs are. Um, as you can see, um, the town center at 1515, you can Ignore that piece, but but basically in Morris County, from a fashion standpoint, you have Rockaway Town Square, and then uh, you know the shops at, at Union Hill, which we already touched on a bit. Um, Rockaway is in the upper northwest portion of the county, and so not particularly convenient to most of the residents. Um, and then the uh, the shops at Union Hill. Uh, you have along with downtown Morristown, which is really more dominated by restaurant and bar and service. Um, the good news is we do have a fair amount of retail along Route 46 and Route 10 um, th that is more value oriented, but, um, but it's traditional big box retail, more moderate. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I have an upcoming slide that will illustrate that there's actually a lot right with that uh, in today's environment. Uh, the larger point here is that for a county that has all the wealth that Morris County does, Steve touched on some of the stats as it related to household incomes and the like, um, uh, with significant spending power that, um, that there really is a, a, is a really great great opportunity here um, for more retail restaurants and services. Uh, the next slide kind of shows this as well. Uh, this is just showing average household income throughout the county. Um, although this map doesn't show the entire county, I don't think, um, it really just kind of illustrates the point that there's significant buying power. Any areas shown on the map that are green or yellow signify average household incomes of greater than 100 which by national standards is high. Uh, the dark green signifies uh, average households of greater than 150 by all estimations is very high. Uh, yet many national retailers and restaurants, um, higher end national retailers and restaurants have no presence in the county at all. Um, and even worse, many of them think that they're serving the county, 
with locations at Short Hills or Willowbrook Malls, um, you know, with this idea that everything west of 287 is practically Pennsylvania, right? Um, so, um, uh, and this is all um, even though, um, again, as Steve touched on, that Morris County has terrific access given the intricate highway system. So you have 80 cutting across the, the, the north, you know, north to south across the top. You have 287 cutting down through it, you know, or excuse me, west to east or east to west across the top with 80, north to south with 287 like a spine, and tying in routes 24 and 46 and 10. Um, I think some of this is going to change with the new Wegmans development in Hanover there at 287 and 10. Um, I think that's going to really draw a, a large group of people um, over to that area and will probably uh, draw people um, from, from a lot of the outlying areas given their, their strength and what a great uh, job they do as a grocer. Um, the next slide, interestingly enough, um, shows a little bit of what's happening in retail. And none of this is really, uh, we could, there's a little bit of this in Morris County, uh, but none of this is really demonstrated to any great degree in Morris County. Um, it is, um, you know, we've all seen the headlines regarding the department stores. Macy's is closing 100 stores. Sears and Kmart are announcing hundreds of closings as well. Uh, this doesn't even include some of the strategic closings by J.C. Penney's and Dillard's and Nordstrom and Sachs and others. Uh, these issues are real, and although they're not impacting Morris County directly at this point, it is hard to believe that it won't happen at some point. Um, the good news in this, uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, is that the winners are TJ Maxx and Costco and Ross, Dress for Less, Dollar Stores, Ulta, Dick's Sporting Goods, Target, uh, the wholesale clubs, Nordstrom Rack, um, and these are all retailers that are well represented along routes 46 and 10 throughout the county and are doing quite well. Um, as for the grocers, everyone is trying to figure out how to drive traffic to their stores, so the traditional grocers are getting picked off a little here and a little there, um, as everyone from the wholesale sale clubs, Walmart and Target, but even like dollar stores, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond has a section of grocery now with their um, acquisition of Cost Plus World Market. Uh, even TJ Maxx and Ross Dress for Less are selling energy drinks and snacks and specialty foods and stuff in their stores. Um, and this doesn't even touch on a lot of the specialty grocers um, that are finding their niche, such as Aldi and Trader Joe's, uh, the local organic market, the local farmer's market, it's all taking away um, sales from the traditional grocery stores. Um, so uh, they are, they're, have, they're being impacted. Um, as much as we're all hearing how great grocery, uh, grocery is doing, it is, but it's not necessarily doing great for the traditional grocery stores. Um, this doesn't even begin to speak or touch on the fact that the restaurant, would, you know, the impact that the restaurants are having on grocery, and we'll touch on that a little later in the presentation. Um, the next slide, um, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide. It simply helps to reiterate the point that was already made, that the department stores are giving up huge market share, much of it to off price. As the slide shows, many of them tried to create their own counter to this with their own off-price concept. The only one or two to date that have done this with any real success or significance is probably Nordstrom with their rack concept, and to a little lesser degree, Saks with their off-fifth concept. Uh, the rest of the department store off-price concepts, many of which are listed here, um, have really not been particularly successful Again, they are really missing the mark on what the consumer is looking for, uh, much like their parent companies or namesakes have been doing for some time, um, and is, is obviously providing significant stress to the department store sector. The one thing to note on this slide is the significance that the specialty retail is playing. So the consumer today is really looking for a deal, whether it's TJ Maxx or Ross Dress for Less or Marshalls or Nordstrom Rack or they're really looking for a unique, unique apparel coupled with great customer service. And they don't mind paying a little bit more for this. So enter the great local boutiques, shops, and stores, 
and um, the mom and pop shops, which seemed to have died in the 70s and 80s with the growth of the regional malls, are definitely coming back and coming back quite strong. Um, the next slide is, uh, again, to the beginning conversations of this with Amazon and the Internet. Is um, I like to call this slide is, is the Internet taking over the world as we know it, right? Because that's always the, the headlines, oh, the Internet, the Internet. Clearly, it's playing a really um, large role in our daily lives, and there's no doubt that it's impacting the way we shop and consume. Um, it is also clearly having an impact on retail. Um, however, as this slide shows, the amount of sales done on the Internet versus traditional bricks and mortar locations is still very, a very small percentage. Um, it also highlights to a small degree, uh, the fact that the internet-based companies are looking to bricks and mortar more and more to round out or complete their offering. So whether it's Amazon with their new bookstores or Warby Parker selling their eyeglasses, uh, many of the traditional brick uh, internet companies are turning more and more to bricks and mortar. Um, there was a really great article, I think it's being uh, circulated here, written by David Miller, titled The Changes in the Retail Industry That Are Impacting Our Downtowns. The article speaks to the fact that this change in culture, not only where we shop, but also where we live, you know, the urbanization of America, if you will. Um, he even mentions Morristown, New Jersey in the article, which is a great example of downtown revitalization. Although, um, I don't agree with all the points that he makes. He touches on much of what we're discussing today. One real point of significance that he makes that, quite frankly, is not getting discussed enough is that the consumer, um, he restricts it to really the millennials, um, are more interested in experiences than things and that they spend less on retail than their parents did at the same age. Um, this is absolutely true is it, and is impacting retail sales significantly, uh, but I don't think that this is restricted to simply millennials. I think it's changing amongst all age groups and has been since 2009. More and more people are deciding to spend their money to get away for you know, a weekend or to you know, a special treat to go see Hamilton in the city, which we all know isn't a cheap or easy ticket, um, to take your kids on a special adventure or to go see Taylor Swift. And it isn't necessarily just restricted to the kids, it's grandkids as well. Grandparents are getting in, into the act. Um, I was hoping to have a few more slides to illustrate this a little bit better, but I've ran, ran out of time. But the amount of money and time being spent on leisure travel, airfare, hotels, dining, and entertainment is rising at an amazing pace and is clearly taking dollars away from um, the retail sector. Uh, the next slide. Um, illustrates just a small portion of, of that. This slide um, from the investor page of one of the U.S.'s you know, dominant restaurant companies, um, they own and operate multiple different concepts from very, very high end to very approachable middle America type sit down full service restaurants. They have seven concepts in all and more than 1,500 locations. Um, when you look at the year to year growth, um, AUV growth stands for average unit volume. It's spectacular, right? Some, uh, you know, sometimes you see growth like this with a small company because as they add locations, the locations with a small company are more meaningful. But again, this is a company with over 1,500 locations and had about the same number uh, six years ago. So um, some of this AUV, AUV growth came in acquisitions of a couple concepts that um, did just higher volume. But what it really speaks to is the fact that the average American household is spending much, much more of their food budget on going to restaurants, whether it's sit down, whether it's Panera or Chipotle, uh, whether it's quick service, um, it doesn't really matter. They're spending more of it. The average American household spending 48% of their food budget at restaurants <laughs> versus grocery stores these days. And amongst millennial and the younger consumer, it's even higher than that. It's 52%. Uh, this is just a small example of how the consumer has changed. Um, look at the regentrification of downtown Morristown. Um, 
you know, it's really been driven by restaurants, bars, coffee shops, services, and multifamily housing. It hasn't been like new fashion retailers with maybe a couple of exceptions. Um, you know, it's Roots and Starbucks and Whole Foods and the lunchbox and yoga studios. And, and you can point to similar things in Madison and Chatham and Denville and other areas of Morris County to a lesser degree. Um, so what that really means for us with this final slide is that uh, there's really a changing vernacular in shopping centers. And I think what you will, um, you'll see is that uh, we used to have malls and grocery anchored strip centers and community strip centers and power centers was how they were all classified. Um, you can flip to the next slide, Rob. Thanks. Um, now we simply have retail real estate. So on a going forward basis um, in Morris County and the rest of the country, it's going to be, um, there's going to be good real estate and great real estate, not so good. Um, but we'll, what will ultimately classify that is the landlords that can bring together a number of uses from retail to grocery to service to fitness and dining um, and really create a sense of place and experience. Um, versus those landlords that are kind of stuck in their traditional format without the ability or the interest in changing, um, and they're going to ultimately find themselves left behind. So, um, in summary, you know, the good news is uh, to some degree that Morris County um, only has one mall and is only a few department stores, and the retail that it has on Route 46 and 10 is fantastic. The, good, the also good news is that there's a real opportunity here to, um, for the, with the regentrification of our downtowns and to create or, and or change some of the existing projects in the county to what will be this new, new type of retail project. And that's not just fashion retailers. It's going to be you know, restaurants and services and entertainment and other components. Uh, so, um, so hopefully that gave a little insight to the retail and uh, you guys all found it a little helpful. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Okay, next up is uh, David Elms to talk about residential. Michael. I'm sorry, uh, Michael. Uh, I apologize. I'm looking at this. No problem. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to Megan and her team for putting this on. Robert did a great job uh, nudging me gently to get my, my presentation in on time. And thank you to uh, Howard for sponsoring the launch day and JLL. Um, so my name is Michael Elms. I'm a uh, residential realtor in Morristown. My office is <coughs> Remax Properties Unlimited. Um, and I lead and manage the Elms Doherty Group. Uh, the Elms Doherty Group consists of uh, six full-time agents. Our uh, full-time transaction coordinator, Meridiana, and uh, Kendra, our social media specialist. I've been uh, in the business for 15 years. I would say that it's about 70% of my business is Morris County. Uh, the remaining 30% is probably sprinkled between Essex, Union, Somerset, and, and Hunterdon. Um, so, just go this way. so here we are in Morris County. Um, I'm assuming if you're here, you either live in Morris County or work in Morris County or both. Uh, Morris County consists of 39 municipalities, about 500,000 people. And um, another fun fact is that Morris County is the sixth, wealth, sixth wealthiest county in all the United States. So to Mark's point in his graph on his uh, previous presentation, there is a lot of money in Morris County. So today, um, overview is we'll uh, cover some economic and demographic trends in New Jersey and in Morris County, uh, the housing market performance, and then also on the horizon, 2017 and beyond. <coughs> so to start off, we have some not so great news. Um, for the sixth straight year, New Jersey has won the title of the most moved out of state. Um, United Van Lines, which is one of the largest movers in the country, <coughs> they keep statistics. And um, for the sixth year in a row, Morris County, of all the moves that they did, 63% of their moves were out of state. Um, Robert, are we going to try to do that little video, or do you want to pass on it? Yeah, 
Um, I can uh, uh, distribute the link if people okay. are interested. But <laughs> that link is just a, a 45 second video. It's um, actually Dennis Malloy. If anybody listens to 101.5, it's a little video of Dennis Malloy talking about the, um, the the large percentage of people moving out of state. So um, people ask me all the time, where are we from the peak? Where are we from the peak of you know 07, 08? <clears throat> if if we could set it on an even plane. Uh, we are basically in 2004. That's where prices are in Morris County and across the state. 2004, still about 17% off of the peak. In 2015, we had a pretty uh, strong uh, job market. We uh, gained 81,500 jobs. In 2016, that number still was on the plus side, but it dropped down to 16,300. So that was an 80% decrease from 2015 to 2016. And of course, 2017 moving forward is a uh, question mark. Another stat that's not so good for us is 2014-2015 um, New Jersey nationwide had, this, had the lowest increase of household income. The U.S. average was 4% or, or 3.9 to be exact. Pennsylvania was at 4.6, New York 3.3, and unfortunately New Jersey was just 0.4. Demographics. So there are fewer and fewer children in New Jersey. Um, since 2006, enrollment in public schools has actually gone down by about 25,000. Another really important stat is that 65% of all households in New Jersey have no children under the age of 18. 65% no children, only 35% with children. Of the 35%, oh no, I'm sorry, that's disconnected. Um, so 55% of the households in New Jersey are one to two people, 33% are three to four, and 12%, only 12% have five or more in the household. Trend to watch is uh, what we refer to as the sharing economy. <clears throat> 50 years ago, 40 years ago, if you wanted a car, you went out and you bought a car. 20, 25 years ago, that shifted a little bit. Instead of buying, you had the option of leasing. Now people share. You share your car, you share your workspace, you uh, buy used goods from eBay, Craigslist. So the sharing economy is picking up momentum and doesn't, doesn't look to be um, letting, letting up anytime soon. <clears throat> shared workspaces like WeWork and ShareDesk, automobile sharing, oh shoot, there we go. Uh, automobile sharing like Zipcar, Get Around, Car to Go. Of course, everyone is probably familiar with Uber and also Lyft. Sharing vacation homes and sharing homes. Uh, people will go on vacation and they'll actually rent their home out while they're while they're out of town for a week or two, uh, and that's done through Airbnb and vac vacation rental by owner. Um, everyone in the if you've gone to the city, you've seen the city bike uh, share. Uh, depots all over the street corners. New Jersey home ownership is in decline. It has uh, declined since 2006. We had a peak ownership of New Jersey uh, homeowners at 71.3% in 2006. <clears throat> since 2006, it has dropped. The most recent number was 2016. It's dropped 11.11%. Uh, down to 60.3. Um, there are now 360,000 less homeowners in New Jersey since this peak. What is driving the market? What's driving the market is a significant increase in multifamily multi development. Um, Mark uh, just spoke about Morristown. I live in Morristown. I work in Morristown. We have a lot of uh, new developments coming online, but they're not for single-family homes. They're not even really for townhouses or condos. They're for apartment buildings. Apartment buildings to satisfy the millennials that are looking to rent, not buy. Um, so you can see the strongest right here. This number right here pretty much holds firm across. <clears throat> These are single-family homes, about 10,000 uh, new housing permits through 2014, uh, 13, 14, 15, and 16. In 2015, there was a huge spike, almost two to one ratio, actually more than a two to one ratio of 21,600 uh, permits taken out 
for new construction on multifamily, apartment buildings, um, and the like. This is um, a topic that Megan and I discussed about a year ago. Uh, urban cities and towns with urban conveniences are growing. Rural areas, areas are in decline. So you can see the green is good and the red is bad. Um, people nowadays, they want to live in a town that's close to uh, probably mass transit, the, tr the train line. People like the conveniences of maybe walking to their favorite restaurant, going around the corner to get a coffee, going to your yoga, your yoga um, program on Saturday morning. So what I did was I did a um, comparison between Mendham and Madison. <clears throat> going back again to 2006, the average sale price of a home in Mendham was over a million, 1,029,000 with 87 days on market. Fast forward 10 years, <clears throat> that number has dropped dramatically. Uh, the average sale price for a home in Mendham last year was 842000 and the days on market it went from 87 to 95. So over a 10-year period, you have an 18% decrease in the average sale price and a 9% increase in days on market, which is a, a bad thing. Conversely, in Madison, Madison is above, towns like Madison, Chatham, uh, are above the market where they were in 2006. Average sale price was 802,000, 59 days on market. <clears throat> 10 years later, 2016, we now have 886,000 as the average sale price, a 10% jump, and days on market went down 10%. So the luxury market is uh, definitely hurting right now. Um, there's a large supply of homes in Morris County, over $2 million. Um, I, again, going back to people seeking the conveniences um, of being on a train line, being downtown, people are not seeking out these trophy estate homes on 9, 10 acres the way that they were 15 years ago. Um, right now, in Morris County, under 600,000, there's a three and a half month supply. So that means if everyone stopped listing their houses and we just worked with what was currently active on the market, everything would be snapped up within three and a half months. Over 2.5 million, it's a huge spike, about, about 10x. There's a 31-month supply of inventory on the market. In Morris County, in 2016, there was 42 sales north of 2 million. In 2007, there was 59 north of 2 million. Um, this is also, I think, a very powerful statistic. <clears throat> Since January of 2013, there were 75 homes listed in Morris County, over 3.5 million, only 18 sold. 18 out of 75, 24%. Six homes sold in the last 12 months, but the ones that did sell sold at less than 70% of their, ask, or their original asking price. So an example of that is you list your home for 3.5 in Mendham or Harding, uh, and it sells at 2.4. Mortgage rates are going up. We've seen a, uh, about a three-quarter point uh, jump since the election. And um, this is, there's different, different philosophies and different theories, but, you know, interest rates going up definitely adversely affects the buying power of the average consumer. So an example of this is a $475,000 buyer. When you have the interest rate jump from 3.5%, which was the low, 3.5% were the rates that we were seeing, I believe, in uh, September of last year. And now we are very close, approaching 4.5%. A $475,000 buyer, their buying capability has now dropped to 416000 Someone looking for eight and a quarter can now only qualify for 717 So a 1% jump in the interest rate actually decreases your buying power by about 13%. Some good news from Morris County. <coughs> We've had 25 consecutive months of increased home demand. What that means is that the market essentially bottomed out um, right around uh, mid, mid to late September. And since that time, there's been a, cons uh, a consistent and consecutive increase of demand over what we saw in September 14. 
Uh, Morris County sales last year, there was a 12.5% increase. In 2015, we had 5,591 closed transactions. Last year, 2016, 6,293. Additionally, there was a 14% decrease in unsold inventory. Morris County supply and demand, we are, we are doing well. Uh, we're ranked four, there's 21 counties in New Jersey, we're ranked four out of 21. Um, we are behind Hudson, Union, and Essex. Again, within that, within that corridor with the uh, close uh, accessibility to the city. Morris County right now has a, uh, a supply of 4.2 months. Uh, just to put this in perspective, Hudson County, which ranks number one, is 3.2 months. Atlantic County, which is uh, at the back of the pack, they have 10 and a half months. Unsold inventory is, a, is at a significant low from the peak of 2007. Uh, we now have about 4,200 listings as opposed to about 6,200, and that is a decrease of 32%. So 2017 and beyond, um, again, one of the first things I mentioned to start off today is that home prices remain undervalued and, and below the peak. New construction in New Jersey is not keeping pace with demand. I mean, essentially, there's no more land. <clears throat> People are looking for new construction. That's why we see such a large amount of knockdown rebuilds happening in Madison, Chatham, Florham Park, and I would say that trend is moving as well towards Morristown and Morris Township. So new construction is not keeping demand, uh, not keeping pace with demand. Uh, prices are likely to rise as the economy strengthens, and for, oh, foreclosure properties are now moving out of the system. Um, we did have a peak of foreclosure properties, kind of bottlenecking the system uh, through 2015 and into early of 2016. Those are now kind of, for the most part, moved out, and um, that's a good thing for everybody. Most appreciation will occur at the lower end of the market. As I mentioned, I would say anything in Morris County below 600,000, below 700,000, we'll see the most appreciation. Uh, not so much in the luxury market because of that 31 month inventory that I mentioned. Rents are rising faster than household income. Um, going back to Morristown, I can tell you that a, nice, a nicely appointed uh, one bedroom apartment with some amenities, is going to run about 1,900 a month in Morristown. Um, that's really expensive. That's a lot of money, especially for a young professional, a millennial. Um, so rents are rising very quickly, and that is definitely outpacing uh, household income. Interest rates rising. Hopefully, that could be a good thing. It will spur people into action, kind of get them off the fence, and they'll realize that um, if they wait longer, it'll, they'll be able to afford less and it'll be more expensive to carry a mortgage. And uh, I will wrap up there. Robert, I had two other slides. I'm going to um, go past them. Okay. Right, thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Okay. And then we're just going to wrap it up with an um, uh, overview from Christine to dovetail with what Michael is talking about. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Real quick. <laughs> Real quick, I have uh, quite a number of slides which are going to complement what Michael said as well as Mark in terms of uh, demographic trends specific to Morris County. Um, Mike gave a great overview of what's happening in terms of the state. Now we'll talk about specifically what's happening in Morris County, which will affect the trends both from um, commercial real estate and, and retail as well as housing. And what, what would, and it kind of will make sense in terms of what was said uh, previously. Just quickly, in terms of growth, this is again looking back from 1950 to 2020. You see our real boom years were between 1950 and 1970 in terms of acceleration and population growth. And since then, we've been sort of gradually, um, the rate of growth has, has decreased. So we're really sort of leveling off. We still haven't hit that half a million mark yet. We keep getting closer and closer. But what the state does, every time they come up with their new estimates, it kind of drops them down again. So we seem to just get there and not kind of hit that mark. However, if you look at Morris County compared to the rest of the 21 counties, this is a state in yellow, it's 1.5 percent. Excuse me, I brought wrong. Morris County is in the yellow, it's 1.5 percent, and here's the state 1.9. So we're growing slower than the rest of the state, but we're still doing better than what Mark, uh, Mike had shown which, to the counties to the west. Uh, Sussex, Hunterdon, and um, Sussex, especially Sussex, is losing population. So where we're still growing, 
the more rural counties uh, are losing population. And again, conversely, the big growth ones, Hudson County, Middlesex County, Bergen County, the more urbanized counties where the millennials are, are looking to move to. Again, in terms of future growth, um, the State Department of Labor and Workforce Development puts out statistics or projections as well as the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. They do a forecast which takes into account other factors which uh, somewhat limits the amount of growth to be expected. Again, you see that leveling off. Uh, what's contributing to our leveling off is that birth rate. The state is in red in terms of birth rate dropping, but this is Morris County. We are aging faster. We're getting um, the birth rate is dropping much more significantly in Morris County than even the rest of the state. Okay, what's actually contributing to our growth, believe it or not, is still that international migration. And we said from a net migration, if you look at internal people moving in and out of the United um, within the United States, we're actually losing population but it's made up there by, by international migration where we have a growth of about over 2,500. Still, in terms of births and deaths, which is our natural increase, we're growing by about 5,000. So between 2010 and 2015, we grew about, by about 7,000 people. Again, compared to the state as a whole. Okay, where are people moving? From and into Morris County and where are they moving out of? So here you see the top uh, places from a county-wide perspective and, and regional. What's interesting in Morris County, the first time what we're seeing is a, an area outside of the United States, Asia. So they're the top three contributors to people moving. So in, within Morris County, most people who move within one year is they're going from inside the county to somewhere else within the county, then Essex and Passaic. You also see Essex and Passaic as places where people are moving to. So we're kind of swapping places. There's still more people moving from Passaic and Essex into Morris County than people from moving from Morris County to Essex and Passaic. But you see that, and, and there's still migration out, whoops, out west. Let me go back real quick. So there are, uh, people are still moving to Sussex County, and we're still getting people in from the east as well. In terms of where people are moving from Morris County, outside of Morris County, uh, it's, uh, uh, Northampton, Pennsylvania, not surprising, uh, Harris County, Texas, and I have to get the third one was Douglas County, Colorado. Not Florida, not North Carolina, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, our population, not surprising, with a large immigration from Asia is getting more diverse, about 25% uh, in 2010, and we're projected to go up to 36% in terms of minority and ethnic uh, diversity. You can see here. Okay, as I said, we're getting older. Morris County, again, compared to the state as a whole, our median age now is 42.4. As you can see, back in the 70s, this is 28.1, um, gradually increasing. Those were our reproductive years. We're now out of those reproductive years, hence the decrease in birth rate. <coughs> Um, the share of never married is rising significantly. When you think of Morris County, and especially we have a large number of single family detached homes, you think of mother, father, two kids under the age of 18. Our share in terms of um, households with children age, mother, uh, married couple family with children under age, under age of 18 is 25%. So if you look at all households in Morris County, it's only 25% of those households are occupied by family with children under the age of 18. And in terms of never, never married, you can see between the last 15, uh, between 2000 and 2015, I'm hitting the wrong button again, um, the never married is significantly increasing. It was just under 25%, now it's over uh, 30%. And in terms of those aged between 20 and 34, it's up to 73%. There's a lot of singles out there. Which is not surprising if you look at the number of households with the number of people, one in two persons in Morris County. That's now the dominant household size, one in two people. And of that one in two persons household, it's about half and half. <coughs> uh, about 23% uh, singles, you know, one person households, and the remainder are two person households. And you can see back in the 70s, it was the other way around, three and four persons households and one person house were about the same, maybe the three and four person households were just a slightly greater, but, it's, but now has significantly changed. How does that impact house, household size? Well, surprisingly, 
our houses are getting larger as the household sizes are decreasing, so we have fewer people in bigger houses with more rooms. So there's definitely a mismatch between what we have and, as part of our housing stock and the number of people who are inhabiting them. We're sort of overhoused right now. Another thing I wanted to say quickly um, about uh, this single family, we took a quick look and I don't have a chart showing it, but a large percentage, we're always thinking millennials, the millennials are only single family housing, but it's not necessarily true in Morris County. If you look at that median age and our aging, there's a large percentage of that population in those uh, single households who are age 65 and older. So in Morris County, it's really it's the, the older baby boomers who are now vacating those larger homes and moving into either these rentals or in these condominium type housing or these age restricted communities. So as I said before, Morris County is still predominantly single family housing. It is slightly dropping since um, this is from 1980 to 2015, so 80s in the red, uh, 2010 is in the blue, and 2015 is in that uh, yellowish type of color. But you see again, as Michael said, the number of multifamily is increasing in Morris County with that type of development, and I'll talk about that later in terms of what we're seeing in terms of development review. Um, the next four slides are going to look exactly alike, and these are all related statistics, housing values, rental costs, education and income. And all I can say is Morris County, we're number two. So in terms of housing value, and these are all linked together. So housing values, we're second in the state to Bergen County. Rental housing, same thing, we're second to, to Bergen County in terms of um, average rent, median contract rent, which is over $1,000. Um, state is in red. Education levels, we're highly educated uh, um, residential. This is age people age 25 and over in terms of uh, Bachelor's degree, we're over 50%. Like I said, for the country, it's closer in the state, closer to 30%. And in terms of income, household income, more highly educated. Again, it's correlated with income. We have higher income. As you said, we're number six now. In terms of, I guess that's per capita, household income. Usually, we're in the top 15 with household income. So we're second to 100 in, in this case. We usually swap back and forth between 100 and Somerset, what I consider our sister counties in terms of household West, Hunterdon County has traditionally been the wealthiest county in the state. Again, I like to put these charts together to see really what's going in and what you are talking about in terms of interest rates. So what we have here is, again, income has been increasing gradually, but compared to the housing cost and housing price, housing has gone up considerably. Can you tell where the housing market the bubble burst? You can see right here, so housing values have decreased slightly. But look at the interest rates. You can see in terms of affordability, as the interest rates are higher, um, again, you cannot afford as much as the interest rates have dropped. You could afford more. But now we're starting to see an uptick in those interest rates and affordability, uh, again, has dropped. Um, just a quick slide on, you know, it's like, okay, how do millennials, we understand that they don't want to drive as much and they want to use alternative means of transportation. This is only between, um, I guess, uh, 2010 and 2014, we haven't really seen that significant of a drop, but you do see a slight decrease in driving alone, as well as carpooling and even walking. But we're seeing a slight increase in the amount of people who are using transportation and, of course, working at home. Again, we were talked about business trends and, and square footage that are really required by today's business. Um, where do Morris County, these are in terms of where Morris County residents work. So people who are in the workforce, it's about 246,000 people uh, in the workforce in Morris County, who live in Morris County. So well over half of our residents actually work in Morris County. The remainder work out of county, um, but in the state, that is Essex County, or out of state, which the largest is Manhattan. Okay, in terms of the workforce, people working in Morris County is greater than our actual workforce. It's about 281,000. So what you see is half the people who work in Morris County live in Morris County, and about half the people who work in Morris County live outside of Morris County. So we, we have a large number of uh, out-of-county, but in-state, again, it's Essex County. And out-of-state is, again, Pennsylvania, provides most of our out-of-state employees. As a matter of fact, if we try to employ everyone who works and who, okay, those residents who are in the workforce, 
who live in Morris County, we would still be short people. So in other words, we have to import workers. And a lot of those workers, again, are the lower income because, again, housing, affordable, housing affordability issues. All right, just an unemployment, Morris County traditionally has been lower than the state, which is in um, uh, red and the, uh, and the nation as a whole. So in terms of unemployment, we're doing well, but we're looking at labor participation rates have also been dropping. So it dropped about 3,000 uh, compared to a year ago. Okay, in terms of businesses then, Morris County has a few economic statistics. Most businesses in Morris County, over eight, about 82%, employ less than 20 people. So the majority of businesses in Morris County are small businesses. And the total firms are about 14,000 or 14,500. Compare that, however, to where are most people employed. So the workforce in Morris County, most of the workforce works for businesses that are over 500 people inside. So it's a large firm that that employ the most people. So the, there may be more small businesses, but they don't employ as many people as large businesses do. Okay, and those occupations. Again, if you look at our income and if you look at our education, it makes sense that uh, half of our residents, are uh, their occupations are in management, business, science, and arts, which are the higher paying, as well as followed by sales and office. And in terms of businesses that are in Morris County, the top sector industries, again, not surprising given, given and the annual, eight, annual wage. If you look at it, it's, sorry about that. Annual wage, it's uh, professional technical services with an average annual wage of 131,000, followed by, again, if you look at the aging population and need for health care. Um, followed by that, retail, trade, administrative, and wage services, and accommodation, and, and wage versus. What's, what has fallen off this chart, as well as the next one, is manufacturing. You don't see that as much anymore. So the top growth industries, manufacturing is one of those industries where we're actually losing um, employment. Again, healthcare and social services, this is provided again by the Department of Labor and Workforce Development. Again, I would take that with a grain of, grain of salt in terms of retail trade. We've heard that the retail trade in terms of bricks and mortar, in terms of employment, may not be as robust. Okay, industries projected to decline. Again, with consolidation of um, corporations, you probably see management taking a slight hit. Again, these are state labor force projections in terms of information technology, <coughs> government, and manufacturing. Again, largest losses. I'm just going to quickly uh, talk about some of what's happening in terms of uh, development. I'll start with some basic building permit information. This is between 2005 and 2015. We could tell when the market took a hit back in 2008, you see this decline in terms of actually the number of permits issued. And we've been hiccuping and slowly trying to get back up again. And again, these are total number of units regardless of the type of unit being constructed. Um, this is actually from um, Morris County Planning Board in terms of developments that are reviewed by the County Planning Board and filed at the County Clerk. What we've seen, again, this is single family homes, single family detached housing. And you can see that, you know, it's, it's been bumpy as well. We had one uh, significant development in 2012, which was in Mount Olive, a subdivision. But usually these are one shot type of deals, it's not a consistent trend. As we said, we're running out of land to build on. And a lot of a lot of development that we're now seeing is redevelopment. And we saw, I think we have, we're probably going to have about, for 2016, we're just compiling a report, we're probably having about 221 single family detached unit, and that's part of the Green at Florham Park. So that's another development that's going to be coming through our offices. Townhouses and multifamily units, not surprising, but Mike has talked, we're seeing a lot of rental housing and it's still coming through the development review process. It's beginning to, um, I think, kind of reached our peak right now. I think in 2015, uh, 2016, we just saw under 1,000 units come through our office. Uh, I had one of my staff do a compilation and just look out in terms of what um, how many developments were before municipal boards, what we understand we were in concept review. I think at one point we had 8,000 units either proposed under review or under construction in Morris County. 
there's a significant number. The market, according to, to the residential, is hot in terms of rental units. But we may see a slowdown soon. In terms of commercial square footage, uh, office and retail, again, uh, we're not seeing a huge amount of development in that market. Again, uh, BASF and MetLife come to mind. But again, it's mostly redevelopment, tear down and rebuild. And the same thing with uh, the retail office space. We're not seeing a whole bunch of new uh, developments coming in. What we do see in terms of retail and along the Hanover Avenue corridor, the BJ's is coming in. We understand the TJ Maxx is on the corner with quick checks. We see a lot of quick checks, and we're beginning to see Wawa's coming in as well. So it's a smaller uh, retail for the most part with a few exceptions, uh, such as the BJ's. OK, in terms of total square footage, um, again, up and down, we're not seeing a lot of brand new, a large scale development uh, under a million square feet. And 2016 is going to be pretty consistent with 2015 in terms of total new square footage proposed. In summary, population growth is slowing down. OK, we're getting older. Uh, immigration is driving a lot of our population growth. Uh, smaller ha smaller uh, household size, but bigger houses. That still seems to be the trend. Higher income, higher housing costs. Uh, again, the new housing we're seeing is mostly again redevelopment. Not a new a lot of new greenfield development. It's tearing down uh, older obsolete buildings. Whether it be um, in Morristown, you see some parking lots being redeveloped for rental housing, or in other areas. Other areas, we're seeing industrial properties being converted or even office being converted to residential. Um, we have a highly educated workforce, which is important for attracting new businesses and growth. But most of our most companies are small, and, but it's the larger corporations that are employing the most. Um, again, uh, anticipated job increases, especially in the healthcare industry, or if you're looking at retail and the restaurant, it's not going to be the higher wage, it's going to be the lower wage type of job. So these are kind of factors that are going to affect future development. Great. Thank you, Christine. All right, so we have a few more minutes. Does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers? Yes, Ron. Um, Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, who you are? I'm um, uh, Ron Sousa, uh, formerly of Delaware Hudson Realty Group, and now I run something called the Liberty Office. Co-working. Co uh, Co-working and shared service mm -hmm. uh, environment. So we rent uh, 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 furnished offices, uh, conference room, meeting room, and uh, virtual offices. Uh, from my, my commercial real estate past, I'm interested to question to uh, Howie Weinberg um, is how Morris County compares um, in terms of, uh, we know that our, our rental rates may still be around 6 to $8 a square foot, I think, I think I've heard. But we have uh, the taxes in camp play a significant role in the overall occupancy cost for an industrial or flex user. <coughs> and how do our It varies from town to town, you know, based on the individual municipalities, tax rates, and so forth. And the camp portion of it varies from the operator, right, how they're, if it's an institutional, there's uh, management fees involved with it and everything. But generally speaking, um, I would say Morris County is most towns, not every town, but most towns are comparable in the region. In, you know, if you compare it to Western Essex County, Passaic County, they're close, uh, comparable. But as far as comparing it to, if you go out of the region, if you go down to 8A, uh, <coughs> there's higher. You know, if you go down by the port, you know, uh, certain towns, Elizabeth could be higher, uh, combination. I mean, here is higher than those areas. And for, uh, we're, we're talking about 8A. Uh, well, lower, you know, we're still higher up here. Yeah. Give us an idea what it typically taxes and CAM would come to around here and what they might be down. Uh, taxes and CAM up here could be anywhere from uh, 250 to 350 a square foot total. Um, and I would say um, in downing 8A, you're talking about probably about 2, two, two, two and five. Yeah, two, two and a quarter. Yes. Uh, yeah, we do have one question um, uh, from somebody on the webinar uh, asking, is the e-commerce positive impact on industrial absorption due to 
warehousing needs or manufacturing activity? It's, it's, it's all warehousing, all for warehousing. logistics. It's, it's fulfillment driven. You know, so trying to get it, supplying that e-commerce one day, two day delivery model in order to get <coughs> the packages to all of Manhattan, Brooklyn, uh, Bergen County, Morris County, all these hyper densely populated regions to be able to supply that number, that great volume of packages in orders per day uh, to these regions. It's all uh, sort of distribution and e fulfillment. Great. Any other questions? Yes, Nick, introduce yourself. Hi, Nick Manoia. I uh, diversify properties in my company. We're multi family developers, and our project happens to be in Morristown. I come out of the ground on the corner of the court and Ann Streets. However, I have a question about the office of the market. The slides are interesting because they show that the rental rates and the vacancy rates are pretty much flat. Why have landlords not dropped the rent for total vacancies? Well, a uh, couple of reasons. One is because they have debt on the properties and they're hamstrung by what they could do. Uh, there's minimum costs that they have to maintain in order to service their debt. Um, I would say that's the m main reason. Um, and How do they get out? What's the, <clears throat> what's the exit kind of strategy? Kicking, yeah. Kind of kicking the can down the road. What's the exit strategy? Um, the exit strategy. Uh, what I've seen actually is with some of some of the exit strategy is just to sell and let somebody who's better capitalized come in and hopefully reposition the properties to something else, either recapitalize and invest. Uh, money as an office building or convert it to something totally different that, um, you know, that making the trend, you know, totally maybe a medical, maybe recreational, maybe trying to get that office building into a uh, residential kind of development. Is there demand at a lower rent uh, metric? In other words, if the rent was $20, is there, is there more demand or the no. demand just doesn't exist at any The demand, there, there, it's jobs, it's jobs. There's The job market hasn't substantially increased. And in addition to that, the average square footage of an employee has uh, gone down. So you need you know less square footage to house those same, same or more employees uh, because of like what Ron was talking about, you know, workstations and we work and how the millennials think uh, they're packing more people into less square footage. We, we do have another question on the webinar. Uh, any presenters care to comment on the makeup of one to two person households? In, conjunct in conjunction with fewer children, would there not be an in increase in single parent households as opposed to traditional two person households? That the component of single parent families is very small in Morris County. Um, I, I guess the one because it could be housing costs related, but we don't see that many. It's largely um, the older population that's um, comprising the one one and two person households. So I'd say yes, there's some there's some younger millennial type households, but it's largely I would say retirees. Probably in the in the one and two person household. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. No question again. It looks like that uh, Mr. Weinberg gets most of the questions. Is it time to start looking at maybe some new metrics? One of the things that the state is that the largest developments are the fulfillment warehousing that type of thing. There are also mega buildings that are have a footprint of over a million square feet. You're talking about eight A and they're 50, 60 feet high because of the mechanization. And you actually said that Amazon actually has three times as many people per square foot because that's because a million square foot warehouse, 50 foot high, is 50 million cubic feet, which would probably equate to a seven, you know, a, a lot, lot different than the past. And if that's where the real growth is because if you're building those buildings, it may mean more that you put in 50 million square feet rather than a footprint was a thousand, you know, was a million when you're talking about charts and also the ancillary things that you need. If you have all those new computers, conveyors, and everything else, that's going to also build the, uh, the service industry because there's a lot of maintenance on a lot of that equipment. 
You mean reposition properties? Well, no, it just have it, right now we look at, you know, single family home, square foot, how many people in it. We look at retail, industrial, just on square foot. But when we start talking about fulfillment warehousing, which is where the real growth is, maybe we should be looking at cubic feet because that tells you where the economy is going, it tells you the service industries that are going to have to service it, and the job is going to produce. Well, <laughs> it's an interesting view, you know, <laughs> what you're saying, but, um, you know, the, these, typically these e-commerce logistic type companies are so mechanized that, you know, you're, what, what Iggy was saying there, they, they need more additional people, and even though they're doing robotic systems, they're, the staff that would normally a million square foot warehouse, you might be able, you know, staff it with 100 people, a million square feet. But now, because you might be, now you need 300 people, 300 people, but it's still relatively to the, relative to the size of the building, it's really minuscule, the number of employees. Well, I was just saying a third, yeah. you know, yeah. third category, since that's the growth and that's telling yeah. you where you're going. And this area for the overnight, because of the population, because down in 8A, they're probably going to yeah. serve 50 million people. Yeah, but if you're going, if you're going up 40, and then we could just get into more details, yeah. but if you're going up 40 feet or 50 feet, you're not, it's not like three levels of buildings. Right. It's really, you're dealing with uh, narrow aisle type systems, radar guided, you know, material handling systems. So it's not like you're going to need people that staff three different no, levels. But it may be a much, you know, a factor of three times the building cost for equipment. Well, initially. Yeah. Ron, you wanted to add? Uh, Mr. Home for, for, for Christine. Okay. Um, we, I think Mike Michael's uh, uh, slide you know, talking about declining school enrollment. Right. Uh, and, and we're also seeing applications for multifamily housing, right. particularly high-end multifamily you know, housing and rental. Do you have an idea of how uh, school enrollments are affected by these higher end rental complexes, such as uh, Avalon Bay has been, been doing? Yeah, <laughs> they're typically not. Um, you're not generating a lot of school aged children coming out of those type, type of complexes. Is, is it necessary for the municipalities to zone for age restricted housing when applicants such as in Avalon uh, <laughs> might come in and not generate an awful lot of school aged children? <laughs> <laughs> I can't really answer that question. <laughs> um, the only caveat I want to say in terms of um, typically, you know, rental, high-end luxury housing is what you typically one to two bedroom units will not, just by its nature, won't generate, generate a lot of school children, um, just the nature of it. And as you can see in Morris County, we're, we do have that housing, but it's not necessarily being sold by millennials. It may be sold by empty nesters. So that could be part part of the demographics in Morris County. The other thing that we really didn't talk about, about today, because we really don't know what its impact is going to be on Morris County, is the result of a recent court decision regarding affordable housing provision. Now, affordable housing typically will provide, you know, even in a multifamily, um, more school-aged children. Just again, as, as one of the questions was, you know, is there a lot of single-parent families, you know, with school-aged children? Typically. Uh, what I understand, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, is that is a component of the population of those housing units, our single single uh, head of household type of um, parents. But again, that's still being worked out by this guy. What, what's different if you were around in the 1980s when you saw so Mount Laurel One and the first condominium boom that happened in Morris County, which was a different multifamily, it was owner, multifamily owner occupied housing. Um, that was spread out throughout Morris County, but mostly in our more in our townships and more in the suburban. What we're seeing now is demand is more, like Lauren said, in those transit-oriented downtown areas. So you see more development pressure on the Chathams, on the Madisons, on the Morris towns now, probably Booton and it makes you know, Denville and certain others where they're trying to say, okay, where's that transit? Where's that live, work, play type of vibe environment? And that's where we're seeing the towns are now under pressure by developers, Morris Plains where I happen to live. I mean, there's it's, it's happening in those types of areas, not so much out in Jefferson or Rockaway Township because that's part of the hinterland. First of all, the land isn't available, the infrastructure isn't available to build the, what the market is now demanding. 
Well, thank you. All right, one more question, then we can. Thank you. Sarah, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, John Willis, uh, the Atlantic Okay, done. Uh, one of the charts that I saw um, the other show earlier, I think it said that, said that some of the a large percentage of commercial space available in large buildings. My question is, what what strategic challenges does that present when you have large buildings compared to smaller buildings? Yeah, um, obviously when you do have, I think it was the 30 percent or so of the available space that we're tracking in the market is 400,000 feet and greater to these blocks. Um, it is a challenging aspect of the market because for our market, uh, that's not really an average size requirement for a, a typical office user. Um, in many cases, it's dramatically lower than that. I mean, looking at leases that were signed in the past year or so, um, you know, the average uh, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 square feet or so, 30,000 feet. So those large blocks, especially, it, it becomes challenging for an owner that uh, where is a single candidate building, the building system, everything is set up for a 100,000 plus uh, square foot user, um, whereas the tenants that are looking for that space um, are, are, are kind of far in between. There obviously are quite a bit of challenges um, where now you know, the strategy becomes can we somehow provide this building or retrofit the building so that we can handle the, the typical users that are on the market that are looking for space. All right, so thank you. <laughs> thank you all for being here and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Well, thank you.